lions. They do keep us entertained. As with all walks of life, the youngsters are always full of energy. Uh, Mia asking a question, can you tell male and female cubs apart? It's very difficult when they are very young uh, because their characteristics are almost identical. It, it would take a very close uh, inspection to be able to tell, but even then with very young cats it's, it's quite difficult. As I'm sure you would have seen if any of you have domestic cats at home, it's also difficult. So once they grow a little bit, um, then their head starts to get bigger in males and uh, then you can start to see that a little bit easier with the with the cubs so I'm just going to move up a little bit here folks and just see if we can get a different angle and then we will also be able to see this male that's in front of us sorry for the little bit of, bit of movement of vehicles there are obviously other people in the area and we're not the only ones privileged to be able to see these lovely cats so I'm just going to turn here to put us in a different position and uh, I wonder if this this male lion just off to our right here he has been uh, very interested in, in watching these the, the females and now the cubs are sort of starting to move down so he keeps his eye on them you know the males they they like to follow the females around because it's easy food for them so as long as they stay close to a pride they're going to be having their food handed to them on a plate and um, they can obviously hunt for themselves, but they would um, obviously have to expend quite a lot bit of more energy for the same, uh, for the same result. Now, proud cat mama, you're wondering, do uh, lions have any similarities to domestic cats? Uh, th they are, for me, there are a whole uh, number of of uh, characteristics that are the same. If you watch a cat at home, when they stand up, the first thing that they do is that long stretch. Lions do that identically as well. Um, I often say, you know, I train trails rangers uh, to to walk uh, in areas where there are big five and potentially dangerous animals. And one of the first things that we tell them about cats is that if you pull a little piece of string at home for a cat, that immediate uh, response, instinctive response, is to chase, is to jump, is to pounce. Now that when we get our students into our wilderness camps, we don't have fences around and lions and elephants can move through the camp as they do here and, and, and in Juma as well um, but that is what that is a very important thing that I've also taught to my youngsters as well is that when you're in the in the bush and there's no fences um, you never run uh, and because that is just that instinctive response will be provoked with with cats be it leopard and lion and so even when we go on our little daily runs uh, and getting some exercise you've got to be extremely cautious um, uh, around predators and and if you had to spot a predator if you and you were on a run your immediate safe response would be to stop and stand still and stand your ground and that would be the cat would almost be like okay he's not running anymore now what so very identical. Um, their tracks, the way that they walk, um, we call it direct registering. So the back foot, when they lift the front foot up, the back foot going in the exact same spot as the front foot was. So very often you can only see um, the back foot because it overrides the front foot on the track. So, and now as I mentioned, I can see on the opposite bank of this, um, of this drainage, no, she's actually on this side, but we can actually see another female, just the tip of her, so I don't know if Archie's going to even go over to her, because it's, oh there, there it was, okay, so I'm just going to move up a little bit and see if we can, we can get a better view, but while I'm relocating folks, we are going to go back to Scott, and um, in South Africa and see what he has been able to find you while I'm just trying to get us a much better position and uh, see what else these lions are going to get up to. Hi 
Hi guys, we are just sneaking through this quite thick area. There's a little riverbed up ahead of us and the leopard was last seen on the other side of this riverbed, slowly making her way into the area of her kill, which is behind us. Now, I'm guessing what's happened is she's just found a cool shady spot somewhere and she's just relaxing. So I'm hoping we're going to find her somewhere in the shade lying up on the cool sand of this riverbed. Now, it's a little bit tricky to get to exactly where we want to be looking because the riverbed has got some quite steep banks so we might not actually be able to see down into the shady spots. But I'm hoping with a bit of luck she's going to be just up ahead of us somewhere here. If not, what we'll probably do is just move out of the area for half an hour or so and then come back once it has cooled down a bit because I'm confident she is going to... I'm confident she is going to pop out back to the kill at some point. It's just a matter of when. Hmm. So, I'm just listening to the game drive radio at the same time. There's a few other vehicles waiting in in this general area in the hope that she's going to pop up somewhere. But it appears like no one's had any luck just yet. Okay. So, what I'm thinking, maybe we'll just go on to the other side of this riverbed, can't, see if we can't get a visual of her from there. I think she started heading in this general direction and everyone kind of thought that she was just going to continue on straight to the kill, but that is not the case. So, maybe she is a little bit further back, behind us. Wonderful. It's so nice driving around here again, remembering all the little funny two tracks and ways to explore this thick area. It's, it takes a lot of time to get to know a property and the two years that I spent here prior to heading up to Kenya is definitely proving very, very useful at the moment. Hi Ben, you'd like to know how old is Tundi's young cub and it's presumed to be around five or six weeks old. Um, I don't think anyone knows exactly um, when she gave birth, it's kind of just a ballpark guess. But sometimes literally guys will know the exact day a leopard has given birth. I'm not convinced that is the case with her. but. It's a very, very small, cute cup that we are hoping to be able to show you sooner rather than later. Some of you may have already got a glimpse of Tristan, the first and last glimpse we've had, and we are hoping that we'll be able to spend more time with her going forward. It's something that you do have to be very sensitive about in the initial stages when the cubs are young, the mothers are very protective of them, so we need to give them their space. But now we can start spending a little bit more time with them and the vehicle. So that's exciting prospects for the coming weeks and months. Good. You guys have got exciting prospects right now, though. You're going to be heading straight back to Ralph and the Lions. Exciting indeed, Scott. Uh, this The female that disappeared down into the riverbank, uh, she came back with these three youngsters that are just moving off to the right now. And she obviously went and got them out of the den. So they've been holed up in there for the better part of the day and being a, doing a very good job of concealing themselves. And now she said to them, right kiddies, out you come. Let's go and have some fun. So they're all quite excited to see each other. And the little bit of the older ones have been playing with them a little bit. And what a fantastic little scene here. And I'm sure they're going to be full of energy now. We do also have another male that has showed up, but we'll have a look at him in a minute. For now, I think we'll stay with these youngsters because they are always amazing to watch 
look at that. Now, please, folks, don't forget to send in your questions and your comments to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and on the YouTube live chat. Let's keep those questions coming, and we'll do our best to answer them for you. We've had some lovely questions and comments up till now, and, oh, look, the, the youngsters are just starting to suckle a little bit. Also playing with Mum. And look at that, a motherly love, eh? Hey? Whoopsie. <laughs> that is very cute. And it looks like they are a little bit dirty. The mom cleaning them. Now, Jen, you're wondering and asking the question, will the, the cubs be safe from the male lion? Generally, yes, because it's probably him that has fathered them. Well, one of the coalition, the guys that are in the area. Generally, they will um, protect these youngsters because that is their gene, the, the carry through of their genes. But if it was fathered by another male, then perhaps not. And that's when we get back to the old term of infanticide, of new males coming in, establishing dominance, uh, they will then kill the cubs and sire their own. Just maximizing their time in their prime and making sure that their genes are the ones getting passed through. Once again, natural selection, uh, survival of the fittest, that is why they would do that and it is also helping to maintain the strongest and the fittest survive. Sometimes very heartbreaking to watch but um, nature is not a soft uh, phenomenon and um, it can be very often so cruel that uh, us as humans we like to bring our emotions into things but sometimes there are necessary evils but it is not a nice thing to watch. Um, as is uh, baby lions or young lions or inexperienced lions learning lessons uh, not to hunt porcupine for instance uh, that can be a deadly game and uh, I've, I've actually watched a, a few lions not uh, more than one actually degrade to the point of starvation because they've got porcupine quills stuck all around their face I've seen lions that have lost their eyes from porcupine quills um, and then, then we go on to the, you know, when they're young and they're learning to hunt, they need to realize that there are animals that are extremely dangerous in that hunting. Uh, for instance, giraffe with their kicks, the same as zebra, also their kicks, uh, easily able to break jaws uh, of a lion, so they need to time their, their tackle right. If they do it uh, before the kick comes, that kick invariably hits them in the head or in the chest and uh, they need to wait for it and almost um, reach past the tackle. As the tackle comes, then they, then they pounce. So it's almost on the retraction of the legs. Um, but then, you know, there's a whole host of other animals that they need to be extremely wary of. Buffalo being one of them. Now, Kathy asking the question: uh, At around what age do the do the youngsters start joining in on the on the hunt? It it, it is very pack dynamic specific, but generally um, we're talking in the in the in the sort of second second year. Um, and that's when they would they would start to really get involved. Second and then third year, that's when they're really getting in there. And look at that youngster; he's got the tip of his mother's tail. It's like a lovely pom pom. <laughs> So yes, it's generally in that second year when they um, they will definitely start getting involved, but they do make lots of mistakes and they can actually destroy lots of uh, potentially successful hunts. So they can become a little bit of an irritation to the rest of the pride because they can, they often, as youngsters are in every walk of life, they, they're, they're a little bit over eager to start with and the inexperience is then um, shown out when they, they, they don't, they're not patient enough and they, 
they give themselves away too soon whereas the trap has been set and they just need to wait a little bit longer but they need to learn this by making that mistake they, they, they don't come right, they don't come right until they do it right and then they, they realize that that is the way to do it and, and it is all through trial and error and without making mistakes you can't learn the required lessons so, but it's fascinating to watch and lovely to be able to, to spend time with a particular pride so that you could um, you could actually watch them making those mistakes. Now I'm just going to reposition just so that we've got a better sighting here. I'm just literally taking my nose a little bit back just so that we can have a better view of these lions. Now Brent, uh, very good question there. When will the cubs start eating meat? They they do start at quite a young age, uh, only a few months old, but they obviously they're still drinking milk, so they do get weaned slowly. They drink a bit of milk, um, and they, it's it's once they start getting those those teeth coming through, you know, six seven months old, they start to chew on the on the meat, start to eat some of it, bite it off, um, and it's at a similar time that they also start biting mommy's uh, mammary glands so it also becomes a little bit sore for her and um, so that's the stage where they're getting pressed a little bit away from the, from the milk and they start getting a little bit more hungry so the solids then start to go down well and they'll also catch little insects and start to even if there's any mice around it you know so they they do start to feed on all sorts of little things that they, they realize the different flavors of things and uh, there's a whole little tackling match going on with the youngsters there now but uh, it is a whole weaning process and the same as you would do with humans the milk is still there as you introduce solids and sorry for that vehicle but uh, this is such a lovely sighting that there are a few people around so the solids come in with the milk being um, slowly uh, reduced but uh, it does take a, a number of weeks and into months they, they, they are introduced and, and their stomach acids need to change as well so it's not a, it's not a very quick process you do need to uh, allow them time for their body to adjust to the new food source and the extra amount of protein and, and being able to digest it and that's a big problem the digesting of that of that solid meat protein as opposed to the liquid diet. So let me get my nose a little bit forward here. Now Ben is asking the question, do the baby lions sleep as much as the adults? Um, this is one instance where they're possibly not quite as much sleep involved as with the adults. The adults do sleep, uh, you know, 18 to 20 hours a day. Whereas the youngsters, yes, they do still sleep quite a good amount, which is good for them because they obviously need to get that energy levels up. But the other thing is, is that they are left in a den where it's quite potentially dangerous for them to be active. So if they were active um, it, it does put them in harm's way but uh, the, I, I do think that they might they might sleep a little bit less than the adults so I don't think we're going to be going anywhere on this drive except sitting here with these youngsters and these lions and we will stay with that and and keep you updated so in the meantime let's go over to Taylor who's got some rhino to show you we do, but they're just standing on the edge of the forest. We came around the corner to a very, very nice surprise. It looks like a female black rhino with a sub-adult. And I think we see them on a regular basis. Although, this, no, I think this is a different one. That's quite a young calf. I don't think I've seen these two before. But you can see she's staring straight at, at us. You can see both of them have now got their tails in the air, so they're a little bit on the nervous side. As soon as I spotted them, I stopped straight away. I knew they were going to do this. I'm running for safety to go and hide away in the forest. I don't blame them. It's a bit windy today. And we know that rhinos don't have the best eyesight. Although black rhino eyesight 
I think it's a little bit better than a white rhino's eyesight. How cool is that? Very quick glimpse. Let me just poke my nose up a little bit further forward. We won't be following them into the forest. But that was such a cool surprise. We came here looking for the small sausage tree pride of lions. It came up empty handed and instead we found that little bonus. That was quite nice. I think they we can have a scan, but I think I think she would have taken that calf deeper into the forest. Maybe even drop down into the lugger and then out the other side. Yeah, I can hear some birds going a bit crazy, so I wonder if she didn't go charging off and disturbing a few of them. They're in there somewhere. That was nice, a quick glimpse. Typically that's uh, the type of sighting you will have of a black rhino, either that or at a very, very far distance away. But she was very uneasy. Ah, lovely. What a cool day it's been. I thoroughly enjoy drives like this. I don't know how old that calf was. Maybe about three years old, somewhere around there, between two and three years old. Didn't look too young. It almost looked um, like it was getting to the age where it will be leaving mom soon. It'll be quite nice. Maybe another another one brewing inside her belly. Very cool. Ah, right. So a little bit of excitement there. Quick glimpse of the black rhino. Rolf's cubs are up and playing around. Let's go take a look. Thank you. And yeah, they are up and playing. It's it's really becoming a a free for all. Yeah, they they're playing tag and touch and tackling each other. It is absolutely fascinating and wonderful to watch. And every now and then one of the adults get, gets involved as well. You, you think that they, they are still young at heart, even though they, they do sleep a lot. Um, and they do all the hunting. They do like to have a little bit of a play as well. You see here the youngsters with a little bit, probably a year or two, and not that much, probably about a year older. Eight to twelve months older. Um, so just like their big brothers and sisters that get involved there and obviously they're quite a bit bigger and, and stronger and um, what do you see there with the youngsters they still play exactly the same and, but all the while I mean even the older ones very tolerant of each other it, 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 these cats are f so phenomenal in the way that they have team spirit team play Uh, Joy, you're wondering if these cubs are making any noises. They are the odd ow, ow, and almost purring like noises as well. And that's where we were having the discussion about uh, can the youngsters purr. It, it, it is very much like a purring sound, so it's probably debatable, but they're making ow, ow, ow noises predominantly, but there is that odd little purring sound as well. This little boxing match. <laughs> that is fantastic. Obviously, the the older one's always going to win, but uh, he does let the youngster. He's still a very soft mouth. See that? And as I say, the, these cats are phenomenal in the way that they work together. And you know, if this was leopards and, and of such, you know, they, they, they're not quite as adept in, in their gregarious nature. And so when there are three or four of them together, you can see that the aggression abounds. Whereas with lions, they are totally for and with each other all the time. And it just shows in their play. And as I say, very important for that stalking and tackling. Now, Ridgely, you're wondering, does mange occur less in the Mara because of, of there being more rain? Um, that's a very good question. Um, 
I, I would I would think that you know it, it very much centers around dry seasons and when and when the resources are very low you have a lot of these skin disorders diseases etc being pre prevalent and you know it can be present here in the Mara but with the resources being very good and the lions having good uh, prey good feed uh, and the same with the with the herbivores their their um, immune levels of, of are up so it, it it's maybe that they're actually just at a good level of immune system that it's not um they not, it's not prevalent, but uh, if, if, the, if the resources were to drop and it would be dry or there was a, a very bad year with the migration, etc., I would, I would imagine that the, the mange would increase as well. But uh, for now, it seems to me like there is much less mange around. And, and all these diseases and, and disorders normally uh, centered around the, the resources. So that's my answer to that. But uh, please feel free to correct me I think that's a that's a good educated guess um, and and I've found that when the resources are low you have all sorts of of problems um, and disorders and that once again centering back to natural selection survival of the fittest only the strongest will survive that period of low resources and then when the resources are good the genetics are from those strong animals that survived that's in natural environments and natural untouched habitats and they are able to breed with that kind of uh, system in place once we get involved we actually uh, assist weak genes and now there's a little bit of drinking going on there and I think this this older youngster he also wants to have a little bit of a go there we go uh, it's a family affair you won't mess up the chance and there when they get into that close quarters like that then you start to hear them with their contact calling it's not growling but they are doing a oh oh and it's a little bit of communication between each other it's almost there you can see him doing it I'm just trying to tell you what he's doing because I think it might be a bit far for you to hear and when he opens his mouth you hear a ow, ow, ow. and there's, he's really getting cross he wants to get in there he wants some he's not happy with his older brother pushing him out the way and it's all fun and games until mom gets irritated and she gives them all a smack yeah, he's going to come and climb in from the top. See, there's a little bit of meowing type noises. Meow, meow. Yeah, he's just climb right on top of mum. Erin, <laughs> uh, you're wondering how. Does the mom know when the cubs can survive on their own? Well, it's you know the young the youngsters they will remain with the pride uh, until the males sort of start getting a little bit rowdy and um, they'll get pushed out by normally a, a dominant male. He'll chase him and um, and and probably threaten him with his life if not uh, show him that if he doesn't leave he's going to die. So he gets pushed off at that age and that's normally when he starts to become into the range of. Um, being sexually active so that would be about the time the males get pushed off but the the young females they would stay with the pride indefinitely um, unless there's some kind of altercation with, with some of the females that which can happen there can be a split uh, but generally the females they're in the pride for their entire life so they never have to leave home it's only the males that get chased out and that's normally around um, if I can compare it to humans around their teenage years when they start getting silly and they start pressing buttons and um, dad says right you're out the house off you go you're on your own and that's the period where it's the most difficult for lions 
Um, and uh, it's the most difficult for those male lions because it is literally sink or swim. They need to uh, very quickly learn how to hunt for themselves because they've been fed uh, by a big pride right up until that point. So they go from everything to nothing in a very short space of time so they need to learn fast and if they don't they lose condition fast and once they lose condition it's difficult for them to have the energy to be able to make a kill so it, 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 it all can compound itself and it's a domino effect the the worse the do the worse they do the worse they're gonna do so it's 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 a very um, quick trial of fire and they need to learn how to hunt and that's where very often if there is another male around that get that gets kicked out at the same time or they come across another male that has been kicked out they might have a little bit of a fight a little bit of a duel but then they work out that actually if they stick together their chances are double than alone so that's when the coalitions get formed and forged is in that period of isolation and the ones that do very well are the ones that work together and the more of them that can work together the better that bond is formed firstly from survival and then moving on to taking over a pride so that's where the skills are learnt um, uh, in that initiation process. So folks, we're going to be sitting here. I'm absolutely enthralled by this uh, lions here with the cubs and they're feeding and they're being active and it's always lovely to do that but we are going to be sending you down shortly over to Scott in South Africa um, as we sit here with these lions uh, we're going to go down and I'm sending you off to him I'm going to stay here so enjoy off in South Africa found this female leopard we were hoping to show you and she is approaching her kill she's possibly already arrived on it one of the other guides helped us by calling us in over the radio and she had just been sneaking around below the radar and I just want to get into position of the kill and then hopefully we'll be able to film her climbing up the tree which will be absolutely awesome Let's just get into position quickly. I have just got a glimpse of her. She's looks like she's just arrived onto the scene here and I'm hoping we're gonna get some great views of her. Now I just want to try and work out where will be the best spot to put our vehicle because there is going to be a third vehicle joining us in the sighting. So I just need to try and park in the best spot so that we don't need to move the vehicles too much when the other vehicle gets here and I think we're gonna be in a good spot just here hello everyone so as Senzo levels the camera now you'll see she's panting quite heavily for a couple of reasons it's a very hot afternoon and she's also been on the move she's moved probably about a mile from her little cub that she's got stashed in some thickets in the Mulwati riverbed which is one of the main riverbed systems that runs through this area and she has chosen what I'm told a great spot with lots of hiding places for that little cub and I'm sure it's not going to take too long once she has got her breath she's going to climb up this little tree where she's managed to drag this big male impala kill and as far as we know she's only fed on its on two sittings so far. She made the kill was it three days ago? Yeah, it was. It was three days ago that she made the kill. She made the kill in the morning, fed on it the whole day until late in the evening she headed back to her young cub. And we are hoping that we're gonna get to see her feeding on it shortly and who knows if we're very, very lucky she might even take us back to that cub a little bit later on this evening. Come on, Tandy. Now, what's interesting is that her sister was also found on Juma this morning, not too far away from where her den site is. I'd say about a mile away. And it would be very interesting to see what would happen if the two of them came into contact with one another, especially now that Tandy does have a young cub. 
Hello Linda, yes indeed, another cat and I think cat a day is fair, although we are missing a cheat, so it was to be a proper cat today, I think we would need to have cheat in the mix. Okay, watch closely, I think she's going to go up the tree for us now. I hope we're in a decent spot, I think we are, she's going to climb up the, there's two trunks of this tree, one of which is angled quite favoringly for her, so I think it's going to be a great opportunity for her to ascend with relative ease. Isn't it awesome how well she blends in as she moves through this undergrowth? What to do? Are you going to have a rest in the shade or are you going to go up into the tree and start feeding for us? <laughs> Looks like she's unsure at this stage. What I would love to know about leopards and something that I haven't really mastered yet is how they actually behave when they do have tiny young cubs. Even though I have been lucky enough to see quite a few young cubs raised, I don't think I was taking enough attention or paying enough attention to, oh, here she goes. And Carl, you would like to know how long does the meat stay edible for, considering that it's sitting out in the hot African sun all day and to be honest I think about four or five days is probably going to be the maximum length of time that a kill will survive in a low felt summer um, to be honest the lions and leopards though will be quite happy to feed on kills that are infested with maggots and I'm sure there's a lot of flies that have already laid their eggs and they'll probably be hatching very soon so I'm guessing tomorrow oh here she goes if you blinked, you would have that. And I can literally hear all the flies that have taken off. You'll see a whole bunch of them buzzing around her. But even though it doesn't smell very pleasant, and the meat is almost beginning to melt off the bones, it does make it easier for them to feed on. Kind of like a well-matured steak that a lot of us would pay extra money for. Okay, so we'll let her start snacking and work out where she's probably going to be most comfortable feeding and then hopefully we'll be able to get you into some good spots but it looks like here we're getting some great views already. Oh, looks like she wants a leg for dinner. And this is so, so important that she's got this big kill stashed up in a tree. Look at her claws there. Wonderful. This is such a good display of how a lion's and a leopard's claws will be safely kept in those sheaths until such point that they are acquired and then they pop out razor sharp and ready to do business and right now they are acting like forks and her teeth are acting like the knives I guess. So a good combo deal of her being able to hold her food in the right spot to be able to chew on. And it's in her getting this protein from this impala that she's going to make the necessary milky proteins for her young cub. It'll still be entirely reliant on milk for the next six weeks. Oh, hello, Tundi. Look like you've got a wonderful chunk of impala leg there. And it really will become a lot easier for her to feed on this meat. I can even, you can even see from here that she's not having to work too hard to rip this flesh away from the bone and the skin. And that is because it has started to break down. Ooh, did that go down the wrong hole, Tundi? I think she's eating too quickly. Taknoa, you would like to know if there's anything from a kill that a leopard won't eat. Yet yeah, there are certain parts of the that they won't really like to feed on, especially all of the rumen. So there's a lot of vegetable matter within the stomach contents of the prey that they kill very often. So they won't feed on that. But in 
the meaty parts, a lot of the organs they'll feed on, the liver, the lungs, those are nice and soft and easy to feed on. So there's no meaty parts of the body that they won't feed on. And to put things in perspective, if they do catch a young baby impala, they will eat the whole thing from head to toe, including the hooves. So they're certainly not fussy, and anything that they can crunch through and crack through regarding the bones will be ingested without blinking an eye. Well, I'm so lucky, well, I'm so happy we've got luck here with Tundi and this kill. We are going to stay on site with her, but in the meantime, shoot you off to Taylor and some elephants. Oh, I'm so sad, everyone. Our elephants just got out of the lugger, and I was telling you today how sad I was that I haven't been able to see elephants swimming for such a long time. Now, they don't have a big dam to swim in, but they do utilize well the river we were talking about, and then, of course, the luggers when they fill up with water. What are you chasing, little elephant? Flaring its ears. It's not a fully grown one, it's a sub adult. Just running through the shallow water there, having a grand old time. It's their favorite thing to do. Well, not that I can speak elephant, however, their expression says it all. I always say that you've never, you never see elephants happier than when they're in the water. That one's full of beans this afternoon. How cool was that? That was nice. They were splashing and swimming and snorkeling and tumbling around in the water. It was really quite cool. Now where you go, you're also charging off. It's like they've had a bit too much sugar this afternoon. And of course when they go charging off they can't help but swing that trunk around and flap their heads and their tails go crazy too. <laughs> That's so funny. I mean they're acting like they're charging something but I don't think that there's anything in the grass. I think they're just full of beans. Very cool. How awesome is that? Where are you going though? I don't know, there's just a small group of elephants here. There's actually quite a big herd just off to the right and in the far distance. You can see them down there. That's quite a number of elephants, isn't it? At first when I was driving up to this area, I thought, hmm, maybe they're buffalo, but they're not. They're all just ellies. And of course the Mara always provides us with the most beautiful views. And you can see why. Flat. But we're in the marsh at the moment, which is maybe not the most clever thing I've ever done because it's rained quite a bit in this area I didn't realize how much rain it's actually just received this afternoon so I don't think we're going to stick here for too much longer because I if I'm going to get stuck I'd rather get stuck while there's a bit of light than getting stuck during 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 the darkness I don't even know what that meant that word I just try to say so I think we're going to have to try and find a way out of here uh, it's quite deceiving it's a bit tricky I think there is a road that loops around here. It's just the grass is so long, I can't see it anymore. And then we'll start heading back towards one of the main roads where it's a little bit safer to drive. We've been slipping around quite a bit though, especially when we drove along the base of the escarpment looking for the sausage tree pride. Uh, a couple of times I think I almost threw Manu and Richard off of the car, hitting some bumps and going sideways unexpectedly. It is a lot of fun though, mudding around one of the most awesome things to do out here and it always used to make my guests happy when we go sliding around very slowly in the Sabi sand or down in South Africa hang on is that a vulture Manu because we've still got our ugly five challenge just up in that dead tree ahead of us no that's not a vulture those are hardy dark ibises and on that very exciting note i'm going to send you back to south africa to scotty and the lovely tandy so she's already come down from the tree i'm quite surprised that she's already decided she's had enough for now but i definitely don't think she is going to be leaving the scene of this kill just yet she hasn't fed on enough of it to justify her trip here away from her little cub so i'm confident maybe she's just going to wait for it to cool down a little bit she was up in the sunshine there so that would have been making her a little bit more uncomfortably hot so i think she's probably just gonna relax a little bit 
catch her breath, start digesting the small chunks of meat that she already gobbled up, but I think she's definitely going to have another feed before she does in fact head back to her young little cub, which is stashed about a mile away from here, so not too far away. And I'm not too sure of the exact spot yet, so I just know that somewhere in and along the Mulwati Riverbed, further north of where she had her previous little den and looks like now she's just going to take some time to do some grooming of her own look after herself she would have been spending a lot of time looking after her young little cub and she's got a lot on her plate at the moment a tiny six week old cub is going to be very very demanding of her and who knows i mean i wonder what happened to the other cubs it's likely that she would have only given birth to one she probably more likely would have given birth to two or three cubs and who knows what would have caused them to not make it thus far but I'm very very happy she does still have at least one youngster it is going to be tricky for her the next few months the most vulnerable months of a leopard existence are its first three months on the planet thereafter their chances of surviving becomes considerably greater because from three months of age they can actually start climbing trees they start becoming a little bit not independent but capable of looking after themselves you know their senses start becoming a little bit more independent and they can probably hear hyenas or male leopards approaching them and hide away climb up a little tree in order to avoid any danger yeah. Now though, her young little cub is still a tiny little furball and hasn't quite mastered the art of climbing just yet. But in the next six weeks its growth and development is going to be quite rapid. And I'm hoping that we are going to be able to follow you along, or at least follow along with you guys as much of the growth and development of this young cub as possible. I know Tristan's equally as excited as I am, and it's going to be Tristan and myself who are going to be the Juma guides for the next two weeks. So we are going to have the responsibility of trying to spend as much time as physically possible with this lady and her young cub which is, I think, a wonderful way to spend the festive season. Wonderful stuff. Well, we are not going to be going anywhere, not unless, of course, we need to make space for some other vehicles to come and enjoy the scene, but it seems like for now we are to stay here for a little bit longer, and hopefully we'll get to see her feeding again. For now, we send you back to Ralph. Well, thanks, Scott. And once again, from one cat to another, we've really had a good afternoon with cats, it seems. And uh, these fellows, they've taken the lead from the youngsters, and now they, they're getting stuck in with the milk, too. If you go in there nice and close, so Archie, you're going to go in on the eyes of that little youngster there. You can see that white right under the eyes. It's it's like... um. Not what is it? Max, the eyeliner. I don't. Know, I don't know the terms for ladies' uh, makeup. A white eye mascara. But um, it wouldn't. Mas I, I think mascara isn't mascara. What you put on your eyelashes. I don't know. Sorry. Excuse me. I'm not very good with that. But uh, underneath the eyes, that white is what helps them to trap light in the dark so it reflects all the the tiny bit of light that is available it assists with um, being able to see in the dark so for the youngsters out there uh, eat your carrots that will help you see in the dark and also um, paint your eyes white underneath your eyelashes and it will help you'll see all of them got a very white color just uh, below the eyes there Now, Dallas, good question, uh, asking where are the males. I think if Archie pans across, we'll be able to show you that's not the best looking picture of cats, but there they are, Archie. Uh, they had a lovely greeting ceremony while, while we were off air. They had a little bit of a hello, and then they both just flattened themselves and rolled over and went to sleep. So that's where they are.
not too far away. Uh, the other one that was chased by the elephant a little bit earlier down into the river, he hasn't made his appearance just yet. And there in the background, behind those lines, are a couple of jackals. Just, uh, I don't know if Archie can see them. There, the, there he is, the jackals just hanging around, mooching around, hoping that the lions are going to get active and he can scrounge a little piece of meat. Uh, he followed the one male in and probably rather disappointed that he's now gone to sleep. So that is a black back jackal. I haven't seen any side striped jackal here. I don't know if you get any side striped jackal here in the in the Maasai Mara. I'd have to do some research on that. Um, but that definitely the black back jackal. And they've been looking in very good condition. So these lines are just uh, still lying down nice and flat and I would imagine it's going to be an hour or two or three or four if at all that they're going to become active but uh, in the meantime let's go over to Taylor and see if she's got anything more exciting than this flat cats to show you we've got something that looks like a rock at the moment, Ralph. <laughs> Our elephants are back swimming in the lugger, but unfortunately we've got ourselves into a little bit of a situation where I won't be able to show you them just yet. And the reason why I can't is because of all the rain that we have had, uh, this area is, well, very, very filled with water at the moment. And I need to go through that little, that. And I think that's quite deep. I can see the water's running quite quickly. And there's an elephant cow with her calf quite close by. So in order for me to get through that, I'm going to have to go a little bit quicker than I normally would just to make sure that I don't sink in the mud. And I do not want to chase this girl away and her youngster. And that is going to be a bit tricky, Manny. We're going to have lots of fun going through that. Manny's obviously going to film me going, going through her in case I get stuck because it's always fun. I think everybody enjoys watching me get stuck. I enjoy getting stuck sometimes. Not all the time, but there you can see the ripples in the water and every now and then you'll see an Ellie pop up. No, ah, oh, one of our young friends, Lily, who is only six years old, asking a question this afternoon. Hello, Lily. You're wondering, how do the elephants know where the water is? Well, Lily, elephants are very, very clever and they've got a very good memory. So they would have been told by their mothers, by their grandmothers, by their sisters, by their aunts, where permanent water sources are. So like the rivers and the dams. And then they've got an incredible sense of smell too. So they can even sense the water that's below the ground. So sometimes in the Sabi sand where it gets nice and dry, so that's where Scott's driving around this afternoon, uh, as they go into the dry riverbeds, and you can't see any water. It looks like there's nothing. But the elephants know that if they dig a little bit through into the sand, they will find fresh water. So they do that. So they're very, very clever. You can see mom's got a nice mouthful. And I think this little elephant has given us an indication on how deep the water actually is. Because I don't think it would have been brave enough to go into the, the lugger where the Ellie's, the big elephants were swimming. I think it was just playing around in this little bit here. So I would say that water's probably about knee deep or so, the one that we're, we're going to go through. However, that... Where you can see that bottom moving every now and then. That's much deeper. And it's probably up to my waist. What are you doing, elephant? It's going rocking backwards and forth. I think it's trying to climb out, Manu. And probably a bit slippery too. You can do it though. <laughs> can I please have the name again? I'm so sorry, uh, Faith. I didn't quite copy the name. Oh, uh, Eng, Eng Fran, there we go. I'm just double checking, I didn't want to butcher your name. Now, you've said deep water, mud, Taylor, what could possibly go wrong? I feel like you're all waiting for me to try and go through this. Uh, we're going to have to wait there because now this other elephant. Mm, do you want to give it a bash, Manu? I think we're going to have to because I don't want to get stuck here at night. So, our Ellie's moved off now, she's, she's carrying on. So, we'll try. Please don't laugh at me. I don't know if I can be laughed at anymore, but we have to go this... Do we have to go this way, Manu? I don't even know where the road is anymore. Ah! Oh, that was deep. Sorry, girl. Little Ellie's tucking itself underneath mom's legs. I'm so sorry, little elephant. 
That wasn't too scary now, was it? There we go. I didn't get stuck. Woohoo! Gold star for me. I get to have pudding twice tonight. <laughs> I get to have Manu's pudding now because he doubted me. So you can see that mom wasn't too perturbed by us. I think she's probably had lots of vehicles revving quite loudly and slipping and sliding through the mud. And that doesn't bother her. And all the little one did, and you can imagine such loud sounds would upset this little elephant. But not it didn't run away. All it did was it's, it's just small enough that it could just tuck itself underneath mom's tummy. And, and it feels right at home and it feels much safer. I think if I was a little elephant and I stood like that underneath my mother, I would feel the safest ever. It's young though, probably only about two months old. Very, very young. The fact that it can still squeeze underneath quite easily. Lovely. Now Catherine, you said that you said this is so beautiful. It is. I wish I could spend all day, every day with elephants. Although I suppose I come close, don't I? I do two safaris every single day. And I do get to spend quite a bit of time with them. That is such a beautiful shot. How lovely is that though? Oh, I think we might watch this little Ellie for just a little bit longer as it investigates with its trunk. I'm going to send you back down to South Africa with Scott Dyson, Tundi, and I hope you get to see that little cub. Well, very, very happy that you finished off your time up in Masamara with some elephant cuteness and Taylor. You are now going to be stuck with me for the next hour. It's just myself out in the Sabi Sands this afternoon. And if any of you are new to the show, we're in a different time, isn't it? Can you so the crew headed out a little bit earlier than we did this afternoon? And I'm looking forward to sharing whatever happens in the next hour with you. I think that Tandy, this leopard we are looking at here, does not sleep for the next hour. That will make our lives a little key. But we can always decide to go somewhere else, depending on how the prospects look here a little bit later. Now, for those of you who didn't see her feeding a little bit earlier, she has got an impala kill in a tree not too far from where she's resting here now and she fed on it for about five minutes she hardly fed on anything really since she arrived back on the scene and i'm guessing she's at least going to spend an hour or two filling her belly as much as possible that way she's not going to need to come back here very anytime soon and she can focus on giving as much care and protection to her young little cub now i could be wrong but i'm guessing that the timing is going to be a little bit off for us this afternoon i'm guessing she's not going to head back towards that den site before dark which means we have no way of being able to spend the time with her when she goes back there this evening but hopefully tomorrow morning or maybe tomorrow afternoon we will be able to get you some views of the little cub I've never seen it, so I cannot wait to. I've only seen a short clip of when Tristan managed to show you guys. It was about a week ago, maybe a little bit more, that we had our first sighting of the little cub. For now though, as you can see, she's panting away heavily, and it's not only because she's got a little bit of food in her belly, causing her to not be able to take very deep breaths and lots of shorter small ones, but it's also an incredibly hot and sticky afternoon here in the Sabi Sands. There's not much of a breeze blowing. And I'm sure that's why she's decided to just sit tight and wait for things to cool before she continues to feed. Oh, I did mention that her sister was on the property a little bit earlier today. She was found this morning. And Joy, you would like to know if Shadow's cub has been seen recently. I'm not 100% sure, Joy, but from what I understand is that they are spending more time on the properties to the south of us. So I think in and around Chitwa is where Shadow spends a lot of time 
with her yesterday. Um, at least since I've been back the last two weeks, it hasn't seemed that Shadow has been on our property too much. Um, but I did hear on the radio, I think yesterday or the day before that, Shadow's uh, youngster had been seen. So it's definitely still alive and kicking. It's just its location. I'm not too certain of it. Um, the show was on our property this morning uh, in and around the Milwati and Mamba drainage. So I'm not sure how you know, Juma, but basically that's kind of in the central parts of our property, but uh, central but south um, towards this kind of southern boundary. So there is a chance that maybe the two of them are lurking around here today. It's just they haven't found that she was last seen alone this morning on the hunt in that area. So I'm hoping to spend some time with Shadow. I've definitely spent more time with her than I have with Tundi. And what I'm thinking of doing now is just also possibly just repositioning a little bit. And I think what would make sense is for us to actually go on a short drive because there's not going to be a visual for a vehicle that's arriving onto the scene here. Um, and what I would like to do is just make a bit of space for them and take a little bit of a drive around. And then that way we can make sure we spread this awesome scene. Angela, you would like to know, is the cub too young for us to see? No, it's definitely not. It's about six weeks old now and you can start viewing leopard cubs from about two weeks of age even. It all depends on the female leopard and how relaxed she is. So the mother will determine when you can start viewing a leopard cub. There's no set hard fast rule with how to go about the habituation and the view of young leopard cubs, but it must be It's usually a collaboration of discussions and uh, just kind of options that are made between the guides in the area and now the guides have decided that we should start viewing her and the cub. So exciting prospects. We just need the mother to be at the den site at any given point in time. We would never go to a den unless we knew the mother was there. So that's one of the kind of hard and fast rules. And in the next few weeks we are going to have the joy if the cub survives, which there's a chance that will not. There have been many, many leopard cubs born in this area and many of them we have not had the joy of being able to follow their growth and development because the mortality rates of them is, excuse me, exceptionally high. Alrighty, so I'm just going to get on the game drive radio now and give everyone an update that we have moved out of that sighting and left one vehicle there and it's very important to maintain good radio comms with all the guides because it can become our lifeline these radios of sharing very useful information so I just need to make sure I do the correct protocol there the trick to find a gap on the radio wave in which to speak I hesitated there for a Split second, and somebody else started talking. And you'll tend to find that most places I've ever worked, there's too much chatter on the radio network. So the only way to deal with more than they often should. How much men can do, actually. Guiding out here, there are a few women out and about, but mainly men. Stations leaving Tundi and the bummer with Mike in position, no other people responding. All righty. So, what I'm thinking will be a good option is just to do a big loop and then come back once it's cooled off a bit. And who knows what we may bump into along the way. We did see an unknown male leopard in the area that we're heading to a few days ago. So maybe he'll be lurking around. Kathy, you've just asked if there's been any sign of Tumba, a young male leopard that 
It's three years old and was the son to Tandy the leopard we've just been viewing from a previous litter. And yes, I'm actually told he was found today, this afternoon, on Chitwa, which is a property that we do traverse. However, with Tandy here, I thought rather let's bank some time with her and stay stay in the spot. So Tumba is out and about this afternoon. I haven't spent much, if any, time with him in the past. I'm looking forward to getting to know him as well. Tandy and uh, him didn't spend much time on Juma when I was here prior to heading up to Kenya. I think we may have seen her once or twice when she would follow males onto Juma for mating and that's the only time really when you will see leopards moving out of their territory and it's quite common for female leopards to move out of their territory during mating periods because they will stick with the males that they want to be the father of their cubs. Now there has been a predator slithering around this area and it's tracks the road up ahead of us. So we are gonna go have a quick look and hopefully we will be able to find whichever slithering serpent it was. Now here you can see the track curving across the road and I'm guessing that it was heading down this way, judging from the way the tracks have been pushing in the sand, it indicates that it was moving in this direction. So, with a bit of, well with a whole mountain of luck, we would find it coiled up a tree somewhere. It's impossible to be certain what kind of a snake it is judging from its tracks, but I'm guessing something like a boom sun, maybe a black mamba, Mozambique, and spitz and cobra, definitely not a python or a puff adder because they move in a rectilinear or caterpillar like motion, which leaves a straight track on the ground which I'll show you now. So this track is slithered across the road whereas a python and a puff adder when they're not in a rush it would just be a dead straight track across the road like that. They roll their wrist like a caterpillar and pull themselves along. No joy with the snake sadly. They so often slither off which is highly frustrating. I think they're also a cause for us to respond to animals that are alarm calling like birds and you can see them all alarming in a bush or a tree and you get there and you start searching for the predator and we so often don't find it. And I'm guessing that a lot of the time it's snakes that have been detected by the birds but are too elusive for us to spot them very easily. able to do safari live in an area that's filled with snakes at some point in time because the Sabi Sands and the Masai Mara, the two areas that we do traverse at the moment, aren't the best for snakes. You do get some areas where snake populations are very high and of course then your chances of seeing them to Judy you would like to know if Hosanna a young male leopard has been seen since Tingana the dominant male leopard of this area had or has has got some wounds and you suggesting I guess that possibly Hosanna and Tingana had a fight it's possible anything's possible out here Judy um, I Again, I'm not 100% certain that Hosanna has been seen um, since Tingana sustained his injuries, but that doesn't mean he hasn't, just because I haven't heard. And <clears throat> I've been focusing so much 
and the bush walks and leading up to the tea show yet. So I haven't been paying huge amounts of attention as to what's going on and I also haven't had access to uh, the kind of game drive radios. Well I have had access to them, it's just that Herbie has been carrying the radio and we haven't been spending time off Juma. So we haven't been getting any radio updates as to what's going on on Chitwa and Chitwa is a property that it seems Hosanna has been spending quite a lot of his time recently. So I'm sure we would have heard if he had disappeared or if there were any concerns. It's more likely, yeah, that, that's a more likely scenario than him having something, having something having happened to him and us not having heard. So I think everything's okay, Judy. First lady of and when will somebody be able to name Tundi's cub? And it's got something to do with who finds the den first or who sees the cub first. I mean, the finer details will differ in every area you work. So I'm guessing it's between Tristan and James because it was those two that were most involved in kind of seeking out her den site and I think Tristan had the initial thoughts that it was in a termite mound that then James saw her disappear into but then Herbie and I found her den site on foot and Tristan was the first person to actually go into that den site with the vehicle and the visual of a cub so there's a few moving parts um, but um, I think it's yeah Tristan or James and when the limits again I'm not too sure but we've got our own kind of rules when it comes to this because we have you guys on safari all day every day uh, we will name leopard cubs at a younger age than they ordinarily will be named in by the guides of this area. So what we'll do is we'll give it a kind of our own funny little name. Oh, let's watch what the squirrel's up to on the road. It seems quite relaxed. Don't go anywhere. Keep doing your squirrely things. Hello. Cute. And like I said, we'll give uh, the leopards our own kind of hocus pocus name. So I think, is there a leopard called Barbara? Didn't James call a leopard Barbara? Uh, it's it's Shadow's cup. Uh, 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 I think I think James yeah, I may have called Shadow's cup Barbara, which was just his little joke. And we will adopt whatever name the guides of the area all unanimously decide on once the cup is a year of age or actually once it's moved off from its mother's care so there'll be two names in most of the leopard's life Ali you'd like to know if Tundi would like let Tumba get close to her cubs and yes she potentially would I've had the most incredible sightings of a female leopard doing just that she was called Ravens caught female and she lived down to the south of where we are here in the southern parts of the Sabi sand and was the leopard I saw most when I started my career as a guide and she had a scenario where she had raised her one young uh, cub who was a, a strong young lad I forget his na name, I think we called him the Raven's Court male. Um, and she was the Raven's Court female. Anyway, um, he grew up and he was a beautiful young male, but he didn't really like the thought of leaving his mother's side. So she would try and shake him off after she had given birth to a young male and a young female cub. But she would actually often let him come in onto the scene so he would sniff her out, find a kill, and then he would hang out with his two younger brothers and sisters while she went off hunting for the next kill. So it was like kind of like an uncle that would help keep an eye on them while she wasn't there. And in some scenarios we would have the following happen. We would have five leopards in one sighting. The dominant male his girlfriend slash wife, her young male cub who was two years old, and her two young three, four month old, a male and a female. So we'd have five leopards, all of different sizes, cruising down the road together, sharing kills together. So straight 
things do happen Archer even though it's not necessarily likely that Tund would let him get close to the Cubs it is possible and already, I mean, some bizarre things have happened. I think with Tumba, Hosanna, and Tingana all in one sighting together. That was with Tristan. He told me about that. So I think that every day the textbooks become less and less reliable with regards to reading them. And then you assume that just because the textbooks say one thing, that strange things don't happen. And I I always try and relate animal scenarios to human scenarios. And you know, you can ask, what would John do in this situation? And you know, depending on which John it is and which tribe he's a part of and what continent he's on and how old he is, John may act differently depending on a multiple of variables. And it's the same for the wild animals in Africa, you get leopards behaving differently in different parts of Africa, and each will be its own individual at the end of the day, so strange things will happen. Who knows, maybe we'll get to see Tamba, Tandi and the youngster all together, wouldn't that be nice? And Tingana, we'll throw Tingana in there as well, so we have four leopards in one sighting. Very good. Well, Taylor's not quite back to camp yet, and she's very politely offered that she will give me one or two minutes to breathe, and she will also give you one or two minutes to breathe and change the scenery before she closes down for this evening. So, bye for now, and enjoy whatever Taylor has in store for you. We'll see you for the rest of the safari shortly. Oh no, now I feel the pressure, Scott. <laughs> like I should have had something lined up for us but no we don't uh, so just quickly I thought I'd give you a little bit of a break while we drive up the escarpment as we made it safely out of the marsh we didn't get stuck woohoo bonus <laughs> Manu was sweating just in the areas that we just tried <laughs> to it was not a good idea to go there but that little elephant was very cute and we saw the elephant swimming so I kind of think it was quite nice uh, we did actually see two lionesses I saw my two favorite lionesses that hang around in the marshy area they were quite far off the road and they were sitting up nicely and then they laid flat in the grass so it wasn't too good for us uh, so, so that was quite cool so at least I know where they are again because I enjoy following them they've been they've given me some incredible sightings over the last few months that I've uh, spent in the Mara and I'm now just waiting to watch them take something down like it only took me four months to or almost four months to watch the Angamas make their first kill I wonder how long it's going to be before either A, the sausage tree pride, the small sausage tree pride, take something down and then B, the two lionesses that hang around the marsh. I have no idea what their names are, but they're lovely girls. They are lots and lots of fun. And I'm trying to think what we're going to do tomorrow. I'm going to start planning. Hmm. Ah, now there's a question from Mary. And it's actually quite a common question. And I... It, it, it's, I suppose it's quite intriguing. It's from Mary and it is what do guides do in between drives? Well, it depends. I find the guiding we do now uh, Obviously, we're out for exceptionally long hours, but we're not doing airport transfers or carrying luggage and all those horrific things that we had to do when we were guiding at commercial lodges. Thank goodness I don't do that anymore. The amount of suitcases I've had to throw around. I've fallen off a Land Cruiser because of a very heavy suitcase and concussed myself and had to be rushed to hospital. That happened once too. That was a lot of fun. Um, so it depends on what you're doing. If you're, if you're guiding at a lodge, typically whenever you've got a break and you're not doing an airport transfer or luggage or a bushwalk or canoeing or fishing, you know, those different types of things, you're probably going to be sleeping because working a 16 hour day straight for six weeks straight is pretty tiring. It's the most tired I've ever been was working at commercial lodges. I'm pretty sure all, all, everyone else will agree with me. So here, it just depends. I like to go safari parkouring. Manu likes to do that as well. We often go, a group of us, where we basically jump from rock to rock and we go on a hike and then we go swimming in the rock pools and climb up waterfalls and do all sorts of dangerous things. Um, we do that. Uh, otherwise, you can have a nap. If you've got any other projects that you're working on, you can work on those. Maybe 
uh, editing photos it, it really just depends I suppose on on the individual but out here in the Mara you don't really want to have a nap because you're surrounded by such beautiful scenery and there's so many cool things to go and explore uh, you know I don't often today I had a nap though I did have a nap I think I passed out for about half an hour it was so fantastic because I have not slept properly for the last 72 hours it's been it's been interesting but uh, with obviously staying out following the cats around which has been also absolutely fantastic I actually don't mind losing out on sleep when uh, well when I can do that Ah, Catherine you said this is such an awesome vest look oh you didn't even show you the front let me stop quickly shall I model it for you right car you are in first gear in low range no you're not in low range we'll put you in low range no <laughs> old cars don't want to the brand the brake uh, handbrake I don't think works very well okay so here we go Ta -da! Catherine, now you're wondering if you could buy these vests. I don't know if they're for sale. I'm actually not sure. Are they? I haven't seen on the website, but these were lovely Christmas presents for the whole crew that were given uh, to us by Emily and Graham. So thank you, Emily and Graham. They are lovely and wonderful. And I love them. I don't know if you see, I have a blue one that has a hood. Um, so these are my favorite kinds of jackets. I've had them my entire guiding career. I've got different ones from all the reserves that I worked at. So it's very nice to have a safari love. Well, I've got to hide my ponytail. Wild Earth one. You know what we're going to do, Manu? Okay. Let's, can somebody please take a screenshot? Because I want to see how long my hair grows. Now we're being ridiculous. Okay. So, by February, when I leave, I want to see how much my hair has grown. And we shall use the Wild Earth logo as a... Well, I suppose... A, a, what am I trying to say? It's getting late now. Uh, anyway, we'll use it as a marker. And then I will see because I did have a haircut while I was on holiday they cut so much off I was so upset oh, I must mess with my hair <laughs> okay cool something random just um, for me you don't have to do it you don't have to take a screenshot but if you'd like to help me out you would be nice I think and hashtag safari live you can tag me in it as well and then we shall keep tabs but I'm not sure if we can buy these ones I can't I don't even know I'm so out of the loop with everything. I'm the worst person to ask, but I shall try and find out, Catherine. And on the next safari, because I think I might be off in the morning, I'm not sure. Uh, busy coming up to Christmas. I'm here for Christmas and New Year's. Oh, okay. Right, I think that the gremlins are here. So there's Ralph. Ralph's also on his way home. Um, do you want me to send everyone back to well, send you back to Scott? Is that what you're asking, Faith? Speed racer, speed, speed racer. There he goes. Faith, I'm not sure. Help! Can anybody hear me? Can anybody hear me now? Let me try radio. I don't even know if I'm alive. Um, am I still live? Do you want me to link to Scott? I can't copy you anymore. Let's see what they say. Ah, there we go. Right, I'm going to keep a bumbling up the hill very slowly. It's snail's pace. It's been a great evening and I hope you've enjoyed it. But off you go to Scott for the rest of the evening. Well, thanks, Taylor. And I'm sure you guys all enjoyed spending some time with her checking out her ponytail length as well as our fancy new jacks very nice we're all impressed with whoever designed them quite a bold logo we feel but i think we're at a point in our in our lives where safari live can be a little bit more bold so we like that it's quite in your face that big safari live boom <laughs> yellow on black will catch people's eyes and can continue to spread the word which is critical that all of us continue to do Safari Live Disciples because the more people that are on these safaris the more places we can take you to it is as simple as that very easy equation and if you're to help just force your friends to watch thank you
I wonder where we'll be next. Isn't that some, something exciting to think about? There's lots of tricks up our boss's sleeve and plans as to where we could go. However, we're not entirely sure where it may be at this point in time. But there will be a third location, maybe a fourth and a fifth and a sixth eventually. Who knows? Possibly 24 hours a day of live safari action for you to tune into. John, you would like to know if there are any melanistic squirrels here in the Sabi Sands. No, not that I'm aware of. I've never heard of one being seen. And to be honest, this isn't a great area for melanism. You do get certain areas where it's there's increased likelihoods of you seeing melanistic beasts. The Abadeh National Park in Kenya is one area that I know has got melanistic serval, genet, and leopard. So you get three species that are more prone to be melanistic up there. Um, and it's quite strange because there's other parts of Kenya. Now the Abadeh is this cold, damp, almost like the Scots Highlands. And you get other areas in Kenya where you also get melanistic leopards, but the climate's very different. So who knows what causes those recessive genes be more prominent in certain areas than others? I certainly don't, but I haven't heard of melanistic squirrels being seen anywhere. The only melanistic animal I can think of here is the melanistic abar goshawk, kind of a bird. Very good. Here we have some impalas, one of which is taking a piddle at the moment. That's him. Sorry to catch you at an awkward moment, but I thought it would be useful for us to show you the difference in size between the southern spe subspecies and the northern subspecies that you will be seeing up in Kenya. Seems like it's progressed to a poop now, leaving behind hundreds of little chocolate whispers. And it's as the impala up in East Africa, their horns will be far wider and longer than these guys. But their bodies are a fairly similar size. Looking forward to these guys rutting. Their rutting season is coming up in kind of March, April. They will all start running around chasing one another wildly and providing the predators with wonderful opportunities to snack on them. For those of you who were with us on the TV show yesterday, we saw two warthogs fighting and they were completely oblivious to our presence, even though we were very, very close to them. And it goes to show that when these men are caught up in their own shoes, they have little or no concern of predators. Animals like leopard can literally run up and just choose one of the two that are tangled in one another's horns. From time to time, these guys will kill one another when fighting, but it's uncommon. But that is a reality. Yes, you, in the coming months, you will be having some ferocious fights. My advice would be to, just like now, multitask. Use both ears to listen for possible things sneaking up on you. Don't get caught up too much on your opponent, otherwise you end up on a leopard's plate. Like your friend that we're about to go back to now. Tundi got him. I'm sure you know Tundi. Be careful. She'll be looking for another meal in the next day or two. I really do think, and this is something that I often wonder about and think about, and, and I wonder to what degree do these animals get to know one another? Because the impala, territorial or kind of residents to this area, as are a lot of the prey species, as are the predators. And you wonder, do they know that one shadow is Tundi and the other is one leopard is Tundi and the other is Shadow? And can they distinguish between them? And do the leopards and the hyena kind of all know one another personally and therefore respect some more than others? And I think they do. I think they all know one another far better than we assume them to. So that's something to think about. This is Tundi got to know a certain hyena, for example. 
Christine, you're interested to know a little bit about why have no other predators come onto the scene of Tandy's Kill? Because it's been there a long time, it's certainly starting to smell quite ripe and a hyena would be able to pick up the scent of that from a long way off. And Christine, there's a couple of things that come into to play here and basically it's luck being one of them, just simple animal movements being the other. Now, I don't know how the hyena have been moving through this area over the last year or so, so I'm not sure how many hyena are around. I mean, the kill is right next to an old hyena den that used to be active for most of the time I was here on Juma before leaving about a year and a half ago. And could be that hyena have just been fortunate and the wind's been blowing that smell in the wrong direction or maybe there's not too many hyena moving about yet it's not to say that other animals like leopard couldn't have come onto the scene as well like other leopard male leopards who knows who could have come in and 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 kill other lions but it's definitely fair to say that she has been very lucky and it's also fair to say that the kill that she's hoisted the tree that she's hoisted that kill to is not hyena proof <coughs> excuse me a hyena <coughs> excuse me would definitely be able to jump up and grab the back the lower the, the lower back legs hooves and pull that kill out the tree so she's just been incredibly lucky but Christina remember a cheat in the start of my career as a guide and was an adult female kudu which is a large piece of prey for a cheetah especially a female cheetah and she fed on that kill for three full days on the ground in an area where there were lions leopards, and hyena and for some reason none of them caught wind of the kill and therefore she could stay for the whole time so had you have asked me that on day one, I would have said there's no chance of that happening. But strange things do happen out here, I guess. Okay, how much longer do we have? About 20 minutes. So... Just need to check in on the Game Drive channel to make sure there's space for us at the sighting, but I'm pretty sure there is. This is the time of the evening where a lot of the guides will be thinking about going off and pulling out the gin and tonics for a sundown. And a leg stretch, which is an important part of being on safari if you guys have stretched your legs for... sitting up in this tree to our left over here. I'm too sure what it is. Ah, it's a vulture. Sitting with its wings. It's kind of, uh, not sitting normally, but it was kind of its wings held out in a strange way and I wasn't too sure what it was. Morning. What's your plans? Are you thinking about flying there? Is there a kill nearby? What is going on? Hard to be certain. Anyway, we'll leave it be and continue on to where we do know there is a kill, which is straight up ahead of us. Not too far, it'll take us a couple of minutes to get there. And I'm hoping Tandy would have Decided to start feeding on the kill again. It's cooled on drastically since we started the safari this afternoon. And if I had it my way, this is probably the time of the evening I'd be heading out. And then stay into darkness. But it is a little bit tricky accommodating the Mari crew, our crew, and all of you guys in the times of the safari. So sometimes you just can't have everything your way, can you? Um, Carl, you'd like to know if the leopard... And 
So even though they can be sometimes in kind of awkward positions, they tend to know that once it's up in the tree, it will be very safe. Oh, sorry, I asked if they ambush prey from the tree. Um, not if they eat their kills once they're up in the tree. And yes, they well, it's not something that happens often because you can imagine it's like winning the lottery, picking a tree to sleep in and then being lucky enough for an impala to walk underneath it. So it doesn't happen very often. I've never seen it happen. I hope that before my career ends that I do get to see it happen because it'll be such a cool thing to witness and share with you guys. But it doesn't happen very often. It's been documented happening in the Sabi Sands from time to time. Leopards come leaping out of the ruler trees. Okay, I've just heard an uh, update over the radio saying that Shadow's youngster has been found just south of our southern boundary. So, I'm guessing Shadow's still trying to get them their next meal. And that's just south of Twin Dams. So, lots of leopard around this afternoon, which is great. It tends to go like that. When it rains, it pours, and then you'll go through a period where everyone's scratching around desperately for leopard, and then one leopard gets found, and then everyone wants to rush and see it. Or you get days like this where there's plentiful leopards for everyone to view. I think there's a squirrel. Yeah, it's a slender mongoose actually. There's a virtual, there's a starling of some sort there. There you can see it, well done Sens. And you can hear the starling alarming and that is what it is alarm calling at, that slender mongoose. Well done starling, thank you for your community watch and helping us find that sneaky little predator. And the starling will be chasing that mongoose because it knows that there's a chance it will try and eat its babies or its eggs. So you often find birds giving off the alarm when they see those little cats. Sorry, they're not cats, those little mongoose. As well as when they see animals like leopards. So hugely useful for us to be able to respond to those alarm calls. Hello Scarlet Sky, you would like to know if the guests that come and stay at Vuma's two camps of Vuyatela and Galago, will they do night drives? And yes, ordinarily every camp in the Sabi Sands adopts a fairly similar method and that is a regular morning safari which will be three or four hours heading out at sunrise and then heading out in the evening usually for a similar thing kind of heading out now at around 4, getting back at around 7, 7.30. So you usually find the last half an hour or so of the drive is with the spotlights. And you tend to find that the guides and most of the camps you go to here will be flexible. Flexible, you know, the flexibility will vary depending on the camp and the guide. But in, in as a general rule, if you'd like to go out later in the evening and spend more time out after dark, your guide will normally accommodate you. So, kind of just about anything is possible with a little bit of prior planning and inquiring. You'll be able to kind of make sure that you get to do night drives or longer ones if you'd like that. But yes, the guys will definitely go out with the spotlight and come back. After about half an hour or so of darkness, it becomes very, very tricky after dark, especially having guests on the back of the vehicle with you, um, because the spotlights are very, con it's a very narrow beam, and it can be tricky for everyone to see the animals. It's a little bit easier for us to take you on night drives, especially when we're using the infrared equipment and we can just serve everything to you on a plate. There's something that 
that we can really do a lot of that normal guides can't. So if we wanted to, if I see a tiny little bird and I know that I'm synced up with my cameraman and he's in the zone, it's very easy for us to stop quickly, zoom in to that bird and then all of a sudden you're looking at it full, full frame. If you had six guests in the back of your vehicle, half of which don't have binoculars, half of which don't know how to use the binoculars. It's going to start becoming difficult to stop and try and show people that bird. So it's an example of how certain scenarios can be very easy for us to achieve our that had we have actually had people on the back of the vehicle it would have been a lot more difficult to achieve that same effect. Okay, I hope that kind of made sense. The kill is on our left, dangling in the tree. There it is. And the leopard is up ahead of us. Now I want to just decide where our best spot will be to get a view of her face. She's been kind of moving around a little bit, so I think we'll probably get our best view from somewhere in here. Just frame up their sense so I can see if there's any branches in the way. Oh, that should be good there. Because Sens has a meter or so behind me, sometimes a branch might be in her way. But it seems like we're okay here. Hello, Tundi. I've noticed that her lower left canine is a little bit kind of bent, not bent, just seems like it's not the correct angle it should be at, and it's slightly shorter than the one on her right hand side of her jaw, so that's a distinguishable characteristic of her, if you're watching for the first time, although all leopards do look very similar, they are all entirely different, and once you get to know them and their unique spot patterns, you can actually tell one leopard apart from another. I'm no good at it. Certain people have got a knack of being good at being able to distinguish between them. Nikki, who's now directing the show, my girlfriend, is very good. Once uh, we were at our lodge, up, not our lodge, a lodge we were managing up in Kenya, after we left Safari Live for a short little adventure break, and a magazine had just blown open in the wind, and Nikki walked past that magazine and said, Hey, I know that leopard. And she said, It looks like Mvula. And she opened up the magazine, read through the article, and it was, in fact, Mvula. The photograph had been taken on Cheetah Plains. So to have that kind of a skill is absolutely mind boggling. And, at least in my opinion, it is. There's quite a few of you guys that are also leopard IDing wizards. If any of you would like to become a leopard IDing wizards, I would suggest you put your feelers out and let the other leopard ID fanatics know that you're keen to join the club, and they will teach you the ways of doing it. There's multiple ways you can. Basically, you can choose spots on any section of the body, and once you get to know exactly their makeup, you can tell one leopard apart from the other. Okay, well, it sounds like you guys had some shaky audio coming from me a little bit earlier and you'd like me to just repeat an update that I got on Shadow and that's B. Wilson. You were wondering if in fact Shadow and her youngster were found. Well, not Shadow this afternoon. Her youngster's been found this afternoon just south of Twin Dam, so just and her mother was seen on Juma in and around the Mulwati this morning. So I'm guessing what's happened is that mom is still desperately trying to find a meal. She's had an unsuccessful day hunting and that's why she's left the young sub-adult alone to this at least one sighting of the sub-adult, the young cub that is going on this evening. So those are the updates. There was also an update on Tumba being somewhere on Chitwa, who's this leopard's son. And 
was for previous litter. She's now got a fresh new litter. Sadly, there's only one little cub remaining. And we'll take that though. Certainly better than no cubs. And let's hope that she continues to be lucky in raising its life. So Rihanna, you'd like to know if all of the big cats are named, and in the Sabi Sands, um, you'll find that all the leopards will be named once they are adults, uh, so that's a yes for the leopards. Most of the cheetah will also have names, especially in areas um, of the reserve where they are known to be residents, and lions, you'll tend to find that, you know, Maybe some lodges will have individual names for all of the lioness or pride or people like us, but it becomes quite difficult to distinguish between the lionesses and you'll tend to find as a general rule, lionesses will be given a pride name and coalition members will also be given a coalition name, the males, but more often than not, the males will get individual names. So like the Birmingham Coalition, they've all got their own individual names but the lioness within their prides often don't. So leopards, yes, both male and female. Lions, yes, the males will all have individual names, but generally the lioness will not all have their own individual names as a general rule. Cheetahs we don't see too often in this area, but in the Masai Mara, yes, all the cheetah there have got names, be it male or female. And it just becomes very, very useful when, you know, keeping up to date with their genetics and their family trees and where they've come from and how far they've moved from where they were born. So it obviously, you know, it just provides us, it's just a simple form of being able to distinguish one leopard from another. Um, it's not that we can ever call them. It would be handy if we could just walk out into the bush and start screaming, Tunde! Come out! Please! We've got a TV show tomorrow! It's very important! But she wouldn't listen to that. But it appears like she has got a plan. And her plan could well be to go back to the kill. So let's get back into a spot and get ready for her to get on to her kill again. I just want to make sure we're in a good spot to see her jump up into tree. Jonathan, you'd like to know if a leopard loses its canine, will be that, that be the end for him or her? And no, definitely not. So I think they could lose all four of their canines and still be able to survive. Um, it's obviously not going to be limiting to a degree, but they can still fight. They can still defend themselves with their claws. They can still chew with their carnations. So it's like their, their teeth on the back of their mouth. And our tongue is good. It couldn't be better, actually. She's starting to walk towards us now. And you're now going to get to see her jump up this tree and start feeding on the kill just in time before the safari finishes so i'm very very happy that this has worked out i just want to get on the radio and just let the guides know what's going on so that anybody else who is nearby can also come and enjoy the scene uh stations it looks like tundies is going to start feeding on a bumper again Okay, so got that update out the way, and now I can just sit and enjoy the action unfolding in front of us. We've got ourselves into a good, good spot. We're only probably around 10 meters away from the base of the tree, and I'm hoping she's going to go straight on up and start snacking on this impala, which is now three days old. The kill was made. When was it made? Was it? It's two full days. No, this is the third full day. It was basically not made yesterday morning, but the morning before. So it has been slowly rotting and breaking down, which makes it easy for her to actually feed on now. It's going to be easier for her to rip large chunks of meat off than it would have been. A few days ago when it was fresh 
and I'm hoping she's going to be able to get at least two more feedings out of it this, this evening. And then if she manages to reposition the kill accordingly, she could possibly come back and snack on it again tomorrow some, at some point. But the problem is those back legs which are dangling down very low are going to be easy for a hyena. Here she goes are going to be easy for a hyena to jump up to and once a hyena jumps up and pulls on those legs the rest of the carcass will come tumbling down so what are your plans Tundi? you have another quick snack? come on up the tree either way at least she has managed to have this kill for a couple of days she's been lucky that nothing has stolen it, so at least that is the case for now. Richard, you would like to know what is the mortality rate of leopard cubs? And it will all depend, you know, on the individual female and the area, but I would say that probably 75 to 80 percent of all leopard cubs will not make it to adulthood. They've got an incredibly low success rate. Look at her there, sharpening her claws bit of maintenance before she decides to use them to climb up this tree. Beautiful, beautiful scenes. Come on, Tunde, up you go. And now she fed on this kill for about five minutes when she first came onto the scene about an hour ago. So she's still, in theory, got a lot more feeding to do. And as soon as she jumps up into this tree, listen, because there's a strong chance you're going to hear a buzzing and hum of all the flies erupting off that kill as she comes into position. Quickly, Tundi. The clock is ticking. There we go. Thank you. Listen carefully. Flies everywhere. Amy, you ask an interesting question. You're wondering that is there a chance that the young cub that she now has, because it's all alone, is it kind of going to get bored and therefore run the risk of oh, how great is this? Run the risk of kind of being a little bit playful and coming out all on its own and therefore being killed. And no, I think the I think a cub on its own is going to be more cautious and more nervous and have less temptation to play. If there's two or three cubs, if one of them start kind of in a playful mood, that could get the rest of them playing and they could start taking more chances. So, I mean, that's just my fear. And again, it will all depend on individual cub, Amy. Just like humans, some of us are more adventurous than others. Some of us are shy and cautious. So it all depends on the individual. I'm just going to reposition quickly. Actually, let's see what she gets up to here. Looks like she is trying to reposition the kill. I wonder if she knows that she can now get a little bit higher up into the tree or if she's just trying to expose a portion of the kill that will be easier for her to feed on. And I think it's the latter. I think she's just trying to expose a portion of the kill that she can get to feed on. And let's sneak around this kill quickly. We've just got a minute or so left to make sure we spend that minute as well as we and I think that's going to be sniping you a shot from this angle. With the setting sun in the background. much of the setting sun as I was, but we are in a spot here. You can see that beautiful orange glow now, and how cool is this? Especially the tech guys and their team in FC, Faith and Nikki, who directed afternoon safari. Well done, Senzo on camera, and well done, Tandy. Let's hope we get to see your little cub tomorrow.